Welcome to the lecture Designing with Air, Form and Surface Active Systems in the Structures by Design ARC 346-546 series at Iowa State University's Department of Architecture. I'm Professor Rob Whitehead. Tension structures, cables, and membranes, and pneumatics are lightweight and expressive three-dimensional building elements that are advantageous for long-span structures. Their litheness also presents critical challenges when enclosing spaces because of the relative instability. Finding and developing building forms, materials, and details that are responsive to these challenges creates a uniquely expressive set of building structures, particularly when we are designing with air. The broader concept of these types of buildings is the idea that resistance is provided through form. So arches and cables and membranes and pneumatics all have several common traits, even though they look completely different. In all of them, the form follows the forces, either compression or tension, mostly a combination of both. In these types of buildings, axial stresses are used in which we're trying to reduce the amount of bending. This makes it materially very efficient. Some elements are pushed and some elements are pulled, and they're all very highly efficient materially, mostly because of the axial stresses. The interesting part is that they can all be highly expressive in very different ways. Tension structures can take on a variety of potential forms based on the geometry of the cable. Is it straight or is it curved? The type of supporting elements, masts, arches, walls, how they're stabilized, either with parallel cables or perpendicular cables or additional dead loading, and how the enclosure is achieved, say, hanging a membrane, pneumatics, etc. In this, you can see that each one of these solutions encloses the same amount of space in plan, although they have vastly different volumes and expressions. So what we're going to try to explore briefly in this lecture is the idea of how do you help navigate these choices? And then once you have a particular choice in mind, how do you help generate those options? So the first choice if you make, if you decided that these would all be tension-based systems, you then face the sort of next set of challenges from there. You could either choose a, a system based on the type of volume or enclosure that's desired, in that you can see whether it happens to be something that is flat or flat, something that has more of a volume of a tent, or more of a bubble with a pneumatic. You could choose something based on, say, the number of columns or even the location of the columns, a uh, solid roof versus a membrane. And when you put them together, you can see they're very different buildings, although they use many of the same elements. So what are those elements? If you look cross-sectionally down here, there's always a load-bearing element if it's tension-based system. This load-bearing element is then a cable, and the cable is shown then in black. But then to correspond with the cable, you always have to have a stabilizing set of uh, either tension wires or something else that helps stabilize it. And so then the red here is showing you other cases and how you'd use stabilizing wires, whether those things sometimes have to do with struts or whether these are struts that hang down below. So sometimes the stabilizing cable can be above, sometimes it's down below, sometimes it's just pulled back, or sometimes it's just a heavy amount of weight. Note how the strategies to support and stabilize each system directly affects the building form. It's more than just a matter of making it work. Two brief examples of a cable stayed versus a funicular cable. You have a flat roof, but different column locations for both. It's either stabilized with other cables, up above with the cable stayed system, or the overall form in which the supporting columns on the scheme to the right actually lean backwards and help pull to take and resist some of the thrust. Two other options to make a more expressive, say, convex volume with bearing cables and struts is the top scheme there. The cables are very expressive in both the inside and out and help create a larger amount of volume. Or the second scheme down here, which is an elegantly simple solution in which the bearing cables are just loaded with a solid heavy roof that helps stabilize the system as well, as well. Although for even lighter solutions than those two, consider the options that come with the membrane roofing. On the left, you see a classic tent design in which the high peaks are the bearing cables. You can see the bearing cables that come across here. And the low valleys are the stabilizing cables. The membranes then serve as the structural element that span from cable to cable. On the right, it uses a more substantial compressive elements of arches, the red arches that are shown there. These are sized in a way, some are taller, some are shorter, but they're sized in a way that allows the membrane or mesh to sag in between while forming the enclosure. Again, the form of the membrane then just follows tension. It's just sagging as a net 
and following the tension as it goes from arch to arch. In both cases, the membrane serves as a structural purpose. It's load-bearing, it collects the loads, and transfers it to the other load-bearing members. So it's a tension surface that sags down. What, what happens if we continue to use a membrane surface, but pump it full of air from below so that it's tensioned still, but now it's inverted like a bubble instead of sagging? This is an air-supported strategy of pneumatics. In this case, the building form isn't one big giant bubble, but several pillows, and these pillows are then defined by the location of the cables. And you can see that in the overall form and the cross section here. So how does that work? The idea here is that the overall span, if it went all the way across without any other cables in it, would put an enormous amount of stress on the membrane itself. The air pressure on the inside is what causes the stress. So essentially you use the cables to define the effective span. In this case, it's breaking the effective span of that membrane down to more manageable uh, distance. So the more frequent the cables, the less stress in the membrane. So uh, if too much stress, uh, uh, if there's too much stress on the membrane, it exceeds the allowable stress and it helps pop the membrane and it causes a leak. And so there's always this relationship between the frequency of cables and the strength of the actual membrane uh, that's, that's being used. This is by far the lightest solution of all those proposed, has the least amount of material, and it actually allows light in through the membrane. Right? In fact, we know that pneumatics have the longest and lightest current spans available. They rely just on this air pressure to pretension these membranes. And so before going into too many other things about how pneumatics work in terms of needing a pressurized entry system over here and how that works and what generates all the stress to keep it up and you know how these cables finally come down and need to be anchored into the ground, instead of talking about this in this particular lecture, I'm going to advise you to watch Professor Leslie's lecture about pneumatics, in which he talks in greater detail about membranes and cables and anchoring systems and even types of uh, pneumatics in a greater detail. Uh, it, once you understand the general components of a pneumatic system, it makes it so that you can, you can see that there's a kit of parts that you can use. So designing with pneumatics is this idea of trying to understand the form and the purpose of what it is that you're doing. There's essentially two different kinds of uh, making pneumatic structures. One is by inflating the space itself with an air-supported system. You can see in here, they've got a fan that continues to keep this up. These are students at Iowa State that have constructed these prototypes. Or by inflating different pockets in the skin. And by inflating these particular pockets themselves, it holds a tension, it keeps that thing stiff, and in doing so, it actually can be stacked and arrayed and arranged in different ways so that it can actually support itself. Pneumatics are energy intensive as they rely on either a constant inflation to stay rigid, but overall they're inherently safe as they collapse slowly. So how do the students find these forms? How can you find a form for a building? Are there limits on the types of forms or, or how it can be used? So for the remainder of the lecture, I'm gonna talk about the unique qualities of pneumatics in the modern history of design, including their relationship between form and purpose and technology as a way of trying to illuminate a little bit more about what options one has in, in using pneumatics and why you would select those. The search for where pneumatic forms come from to me is fascinating because it isn't formulaic and it isn't even frankly architectural in its roots. There are some basic technological relationships that we can understand here, like the first aerostat balloons and pneumatic structures that are shown in this, in this image. All of these are basically uh, have a membrane that's resisted, the stress of it's resisted uh, through wires, and some sort of constant relationship between the membrane and the wires, and, and the location of the wires, and how they hold everything together, and then of course a fuel source that continues to lift and elevate these particular aerostats. So then the building's form is defined by the pattern of the membrane and the tension wires across the surface closer the cables are spaced, less uh, stress on the membrane. So the cables that act like de facto beams, they collect the loads from the membranes and in a confusing twist of geometry and stress, the cables and membranes are both arched, inflated, but both are resisting tension and not compression. One of my favorite images over here on the right because I think it, it says so much about a particular era of technology and form and you know just general volume. And so you have the Mosque of Muhammad Ali in uh, Cairo here. 
and of course a, a Zeppelin air inflated uh, blimp that, that's flying over it. And the, the fascinating part to me is that uh, these were constructed within a decade of each other. And so the reason I think that's such a, a, a striking contrast to see one flying over the other, and I've, I've generated as, as easily and accurately as I could a comparative section. And you think about all the differences between these two particular types of structures, radical changes in how you think about weight and efficiency and overall volume, how they're constructed, and even what it means to construct social and construction values with something that's light enough literally to fly and something else that is built with something that's very, very heavy but constructed in a way to try to maximize the interior volume through those domes. So pneumatics have always sort of asked this question is what is their purpose? Is their purpose architectural? Is their purpose trans-architectural? What, what, what is the sort of traditional and or non-traditional roles for these building efforts? So in here you can see that you know some of the first uses of widespread uses of pneumatics, once the membranes became stronger, typically in World War II and post-World War II, when the membranes became stronger, they were used for temporary things like uh, uh, bridges and shelters. They were used as uh, you know, inflatable things that could be lifted out into the field. There's the radon up above here, the radon enclosure in which you'd have a secret radar uh, space inside of here during the 1950s. But by putting an inflatable uh, bubble on top of it, you'd be able to hide it from uh, any enemy spies. And even then, a, a, a wonderful story, hopefully you can look this up and listen to it about the, the ghost tanks and the idea of creating tanks out of pneumatics to try to fool our enemies in World War II that we actually had more tanks and more forces in particular spaces. I'd like to quote one of uh, Walter Byrd here is one of the pioneers of, of using pneumatics that the air structure is the most efficient structural form available to date. It can be, it can be made easily portable and lends itself readily to the design of demountable or removable structures. And look at those words. Those are relatively radical ideas for architecture. The idea that it's demountable or that it's, you know, removable or even movable. So the idea that architecture can be easily portable and in fact rapidly deployed is a, is a relatively radical idea. But there was these inflection points throughout the history of, of how pneumatics were used that, that's worth pointing out here. So even though there's this technology transfer where a lot of the initial uh, innovations of these building systems came from uh, warlike efforts, how was it actually used? It was used to make these portable pools, these air inflated year round swimming domes. And so the people who sold these, Bird, you know, Bird Air, uh, was a multi million dollar company in the 1960s. They had 50 plus different manufacturers and they made all these little pneumatics. And so you could just buy this pneumatic and set it outside your home and have a swimming pool in it. So they were essentially just smaller shelters. Now, Architectural Forum in 1959 sort of warned that this seems like a pretty simplistic use of something that has so much upside. And so they warned that just simply having them be shelters uh, could hamper their future in terms of their development. Another inflection point came in the, um, in the mid 1960s to the late 1960s and early 1970s. And we started to think about this, this question of whether pneumatics was a shelter or whether these things because of their unique building forms were something of more artistic experiences. So particularly in Expo 64, there were three or four different uh, formative pneumatic structures that were there that were in incredibly influential. 19, by 1967, you can see that, you know, Graham Stevens with his Atmos field had a gigantic inflatable tube and this tube then went across a river and you could walk on it and, and, and float on the, the water that way. There's a boldness and there's a, uh, to the scale of these works, especially when they're put in landscapes, either on water or floating above the landscape. And there's also a boldness to how these were experienced by people in non-traditional ways. But what I wanted to bring up and the reason I call this an inflection point is that the inflection point here is that these were not done for any sort of uh, purposes of humanitarian missions. Uh, this wasn't done for any uh, traditional building typologies. These were seen sort of as playgrounds, artistic installations. Years before these inflection points happened, a German engineer and architect named Fry Otto was starting to think more and more about tension surfaces and pneumatics, but not just from the level of, well, should they be just a shelter or you know, should they be something that's artistic? But instead, 
he starts to think of them in, in probably the broadest and uh, most profound way that, that you can think about architecture. He starts to think about this tensed surface of pneumatics as the essence of material form. He sees the benefit of it is that the form is the most minimal tensed surface area. So if you wanted to try to have a structure that was of minimal amount of area and the highest level of efficiency and was light and adaptable, the pneumatics would be what you would want to look at. But he also saw this as the key to much larger uh, pressing worldwide environmental things even in the late 50s and early 60s, well before others. He talked about pneumatics as being of a min minimal material and time related to economy and energy. So instead of just seeing these shelters as like, well, what happens within them? Actually sees this as an approach to design that's related to economy and energy. And you can see his quote not too long before he died that his hope was that light, flexible architecture might bring about a new and open society. He saw pneumatics as that level of sort of radicalness. For Otto, this wasn't just a search for forms. It was a way of connecting back into a broader ecological framework. He saw news all around him at the cellular level, at the, you know, at the level of a uh, human body. And he felt that by learning from nature, we could create new buildings. And so his idea of minimal material and time was central to this future. And so he starts to understand that the, the search for these forms themselves and where those soap bubble experiments came from, which we saw a couple slides back, was the forms themselves are rarely coincidental. In other words, these are perfectly tensed surfaces and only certain geometries could remain perfectly tensed because then if any sort of bending or any other stresses got within the surface of that system, the soap bubble would pop. So in 1953, he wrote a dissertation and this was, I think, a, an incredibly interesting dissertation because he made the leap not just from what's the type of uh, uh, tensed structure that he can make, but looking at what's the purposefulness of it. And so in his dis dissertation of the suspended roof, he looked for a large span roof in a climate controlled in a climate controlled area for a city in Antarctica. In other words, he was trying to see like how he could expand and enclose inhospitable places. This became a really uh, fascinating set of uh, obsessions and work for him between 1957 and 1962, which he documented through a series of different uh, physical form models and even renderings. And this one, you can see one of his experiments for a massive greenhouse. So then this greenhouse could essentially be inflated anywhere. And inflating this thing anywhere, the greenhouse, because the membrane was transparent and translucent, you'd be able to grow things in it. But I also find what's really fascinating is uh, the way that it has these little divots inside of it. Not only is this a way to be able to help control, you can see, of course, that the cables would be coming across, but these divots would also be a way of helping to collect water. And that water would then be able to be harvested and then used and incorporated within the greenhouse itself. It's more than just a structure. He was actually looking to replace the plastics and concrete that were common, commonly used then for these water storage areas. And then he started to think about these as areas with little access to these heavy materials, but they still needed secure food and secured water. And I think that's just a brilliant idea of equating that the, the economy and energy and lightness of the material might also be used to be able to expand access, access to architecture, access to architecture for things that aren't shelter, but access to architecture for things like how to store food and how to store water safely. Had a few uh, really radical ideas also that he, that he had proposed again between 57 and 62, that pneumatics themselves actually could be used for flood control. And so uh, in this one, you can see that uh, a whole mesh or net of pneumatics could actually be tied back and tethered back into the sides of banks over here and inflated and inflated as a bit of a dam or several dams as they went through. A relatively radical idea, right? And you can see that the pillows then would be in here and here or the idea that you could actually have pneumatics around the outside of something and be able to enclose water and by enclosing water around this, you could you know have those be habitable areas uh, within, you know, a larger sort of body of water, undisturbed body of water. Now, I'm a bit skeptical that something like this could just be rolled out to stop a, a flood instantly, but imagine the amount of resources it would take to do that, right? But look at the idea of what he's actually proposing here isn't so much a disaster relief 
I think, is he's proposing resiliency. And again, instead of thinking about all the concrete and all the labor force that it would take to create these dams, what if they could be made from lightweight materials that were easily transported and easily deployed to do so? Another one of his experiments, he started to look at infrastructural issues that could be solved perhaps by pneumatics and whether this was a bridge and that that bridge could be tethered down into the base of the water and you could actually have pneumatics that enclosed a, a gigantic bubble. What distinguished Otto from other people though was that in his volume one of the work where he showed all this work between 57 and 62, these are again, like I said, an amazing amount of sketches, hundreds of drawings and models. He then sets out the next part of his book to actually show how one could start to calculate these things. He shows that the method for how one would be able to analyze these surfaces to be able to see what stresses would be in there. Therefore, you could actually take these not as just hypothetical designs, but if a person wanted to, you could actually use this as a guide, a guide way to actually uh, make some prototypes and test those prototypes and actually solve the engineering behind it. Finally, in 1971, nearly 20 years after his proposal for his dissertation, he worked with uh, Kenzo Tanje and Ove Arup and Associates on a realization of his city in Antarctica, which this one was just called a city in the Arctic in 1971. The idea here was that it would house 40,000 people under a gigantic two kilometer uh, diameter dome in the Arctic Circle. This was proposed to try to show that if there was concerns for like what their ecological future might look like, again, or inha uninhabitable spaces, how we, how we can make those inhabitable. So there's this promise of innovative structural technology and the ability to provide these particular solutions. So again, with his collaborators, he went through and did all the different types of calculations in here and showed that in fact, you know, they could resist this amount of tension that was in the grids, pressure point that came through in which goods and services could be brought in by boat. I believe they had a nuclear power plant that was inside of here. So the boldness of, of Fry Otto's work makes you wonder like, okay, well, how can you actually design pneumatics? If you wanted to explore some of these ideas, what are good ways of actually finding out uh, how, what, what forms are acceptable for pneumatics? The first thing I would advise you is uh, think about doing physical prototypes first. Almost all of the first things that, um, that Otto worked on were all done through physical prototypes. And uh, in his physical prototypes, he would just take different membranes and he would inflate them to different degrees and he would be able to test them that way. But before you even get to what the physical uh, uh, prototype is, you have to have certain boundary conditions to this. So if you're gonna make an air inflated form, think about the boundary conditions. In other words, what is the plan form? You can see that in different examples here, whether that's something that is squared off or elliptical or circular. Think about what sort of interior volume is required. And I call this the, the, the cutting plane. You can see that that could either be the quarter sphere here or the three quarter sphere. And then what's the frequency of the panels that you think or the seams in the membrane? Is if you actually think about that, you know, how they are gonna define the overall boundaries of this. Fewer cables than the more sort of, you know, bump it's gonna have in between the cables themselves. But the more frequent the cables, the more tightly it's gonna, you know, adhere to this particular type of form. And even you can see that it depends on how you do it. You can tense some of these cables and have some of these cables a little bit shorter, but allow others just to be longer so that the pneumatic itself is able to change its form. So it isn't just a bubble, it isn't just a balloon. Then of course, after that, you wanna think about what the overall pressure is that you wanna have, that you wanna uh, exert on there. And after you're doing that, as you saw from Professor Leslie's uh, lecture, you have to find a way in and out. You have to find a way of anchoring it down. You have to find a way of making sure that those cables and the membranes coexist well. So these are a series of experiments that Otto did, again, using inflatable membranes, which he varied the size of the boundary conditions on the outside, varied the type of uh, pressure that was applied in here. And with that, he got some you know, pretty radical and, and fascinating ideas. Luckily, even our modern technology allows us to do this as well. This right here is a, a, a plug-in for SketchUp, a 2018 SketchUp called Soap Skin and Bubble Extensions. With that, I've drawn four different profiles of plans. I've gone through and I've defined a particular uh, area with those plans. I go through, I make sure that we're able to select that. I'm gonna go over, turn it into a bubble. I go down and I type in the amount of pressure that should be put on that particular bubble. 
then it automatically inflates it. It uses an algorithm to automatically inflate it. With that, you can see that that's the particular form. So now what if your form, like what if your plan itself changed? So this one again, I'm gonna put a skin on there. You can see the division of the skin, 10, is a, a lot. Those were very, very big. So instead I changed it to 45. So it'll be much, much, much smaller squares that are within there. So now that we know that there'll be smaller squares, which makes it actually, so it's gonna be a more gradual curve to it. I'm gonna select it again, I'm gonna inflate it. And this time the pressure, you know, is gonna be uh, not as much as the previous one. I'm gonna keep it relatively low. So you can see that it inflates and we get the overall double curvature of the form there. So you can go through this experiment over and over with different things. Let's see what happens if we blow it up. So look at that. Now that works for an app, but there's no possible way this is gonna work for the actual building system itself. It's gonna, the, the, the membrane itself won't be squared. It won't be uh, in those big chunks like that. It's gonna cause a great deal of different stress all the way throughout those. So then briefly back to auto as we're talking about uh, finding forms and testing forms, he forms the Institute for Lightweight Structures at the University of Stuttgart in uh, 71 through 88. And they did a whole series of these research publications that were about, the, so the IL of Institute of Lightweight Structures, they were about these pneumatics. And so um, these were the single most popular topics in all of the Institute of Lightweight Structures publications. These are fascinating reads if you're at all interested in the variety of different possible forms and the variety of different possible applications of pneumatics. Uh, in each one of these, there's a comprehensive collage of like over a thousand actual proposed pneumatic objects. So the first generation was what was called then the balloon analogy. That was similar to the SketchUp model we just showed, fill something up. The second generation was the machine analogy. And the third generation of different forms that they produced were the biological organisms. And these biological organisms were actually meant to have uh, a much broader set of uh, performance characteristics with them besides just shelter. So there's decades and decades long uh, interaction then between trying to find a pneumatic form and their overall performance. In summary, when you think about pneumatics, you wanna think about the purpose of the pneumatics and where the pneumatic form came from or what it's trying to achieve. Because you could see throughout the lecture that there were very different ways in which shelter itself was possible and enclosure was possible. And unlike the other tension-based systems in which it could be somewhat formulaic in terms of what were the bearing cables, what were the stabilizing cables, the placement of the columns, pneumatics itself is relatively untethered to those constraints. A whole bunch of different forms are in fact possible. So when you think about pneumatics, do place it within a larger context in your mind in thinking about the design and the purpose of design and how that then relates to the overall form. Thanks for watching.